so I had the global solutions architecture team at WSO2. Uh, we are a team distributed uh, in, in nine different countries. Uh, so whenever you talk to someone from WSO2 who's from the technical team uh, at the first stages of the lead, uh, that will be someone from the SA team. I also had our healthcare solutions practice, which was our newer effort around productizing our uh, experience in healthcare. I've been with the company for around eight years now, uh, and I'm based out of the East Coast, uh, New Jersey, to be exact. All right, so we had a great lineup of sessions today. Uh, just concluded Asanka's session on the supply chain and, and how APIs and abstractions build into it. Uh, we started off with Sanjeeva's session on, on the overall concept of abstractions in computer science, uh, and, and then great sessions from uh, Greg's conversation with Robert. Uh, we, we had uh, multiple sessions from uh, Newtonix as well, so and, and Eric as well. So some really good sessions building up to this. But in this session, I'm going to deviate a little bit and take an industry example, right? And I think the session after this, uh, we'll also go into the healthcare industry. But of course, many of the concepts here apply to other industries as well, right? But this is really putting a concrete spin on, on some of the concepts that we spoke about uh, today. All right. So I'll start with this slide. It's a little bit of a crowded slide, but, but really what we're trying to say here is that innovation in digital health is not just a competitive advantage, but it's a necessity as well. So we started the session or started the day by talking about digital innovation, why uh, differentiation is quite important, uh, consumer differentiation specifically, and why digital transformation and interoperability is basically a key part of that. Right? But one of the differences in the healthcare industry was that it was a necessity uh, to basically innovate. Right? The, the pandemic showed us that. Before the pandemic, especially in the US, healthcare was a was mostly a face-to-face -face initiative, right? Yes, there was initiatives to make things more digital, come up with more telemedicine initiatives. But then when the pandemic struck, there was quite a few providers and payers and pharma organizations that realized that they weren't digital enough, right? So lots of organizations struggled to uh, aggressively transform digitally, aggressively launch digital products. And that's when they started looking internally to see whether they have interoperability, whether they have the right kind of APIs, whether they have the right kind of security, all of that, right? So that was a big struggle. Uh, that small picture on the right-hand side of your screen, or the left, I'm not sure which side you see, is a roadmap from the US government, the Health and Human Services, as part of their healthit.gov initiative, which talks about a 10-year roadmap, right? In three years, What's, what's the plan in three years? What's the plan in six years? What's the plan in 10 years? The government started off with really good initiatives about around interoperability and standardization. So in three years, the plan was to push these interoperability concepts out. In six years, the plan was to have applications and, and real world use cases that really use interoperability. And in 10 years, the plan was or is to basically have a learning healthcare system where you have a system where everything's shared, everything's secure, everything's available, everything's owned by the users or patients, and the system has enough information and it has a feedback loop so that it can really learn and it can continuously evolve, right? So there are some initiatives already in place, right? In US, you have something called value-based care, where instead of getting patients to just pay for each visit, you, you have a payment model which is based on the outcomes. Right. So it's outcomes based care or value based care. So there's a lot of initiatives going on, especially in the US, but this applies to the rest of the world as well. But one of the things we also realized during the pandemic is that healthcare innovation is at an all time high. Right. There are multiple statistics. Some organizations struggled, yes, but some organizations had around eight years of digital transformation within a year. Right. So 2020, like the latter part of 2020 and the early part of 2021, saw significant amounts of interoperability and innovation in the space. Right? There were multiple joint ventures, partnerships, MNAs happening due to this time. Uh, Microsoft's second largest acquisition was Navitech, which was a healthcare AI company. Uh, we saw a lot of big tech 
moving into healthcare and some of big tech moving out of healthcare, right? So we saw Amazon basically getting into the pharma industry. And then very recently we saw Apple and, and Google uh, moving healthcare from their regional divisions to a central division, right? So stop stopping focus on, on at a regional level, but basically look, looking at it at a centralized level. Right? So a lot of changes happening. 2021 or 2020 Q3 was the highest ever in terms of private equity funding for healthcare startups as well, right? So that, that shows that there's quite a big momentum in the space. Uh, there is there are stats that basically positions the world healthcare or digital healthcare market at around 456 billion by 2026 and at an 18% compound annual growth rate. Right? So a lot of growth, uh, especially in the digital health space so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take some of the challenges in digital healthcare uh, we'll list down the challenges we'll talk about the different problems and we'll build out a playbook at the end and that will come back to the theme of the topic which is healthcare innovation is really uh, an intersection of interoperability and privacy so if you look at some of the common concepts in healthcare and and this is very similar in banking finance any other industry as well right so source data or da the source of truth is basically uh, in a few systems, right? In healthcare, they are called electronic health record systems or electronic medical record systems, EHR, EMR. Uh, in some organizations, you have revenue cycle management systems in, in pharmacies, uh, sorry, in, in uh, insurance uh, industry. Uh, in the insurance industry, you have claim management systems as well. So you have different types of source systems. And the main part is getting information out of the source systems in a meaningful way and making it accessible for modernization. This is very similar in the banking finance industry as well. You have co-banking systems. You have a lot of data sitting there and you need to get the data out of those systems, transforming it into a meaningful uh, format and then making it available to the right teams, right? any industry, telco, so on and so forth. The second part is now once you start gathering all this information, you have to look at consolidation of information or consolidation of data. That's where things like canonical data models come in. Right? In, in the API space, you have the open API specifications, which have been evolving over time. You have the newer specifications coming out. In the healthcare space, you have standards like uh, HL7 and FHIR. We'll look at that in a bit. But canonical models are important, especially because you're going to pull information from multiple sources. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, this is a, uh, an article published in Forbes the earlier part of this year. Uh, that's an example of, a, of a, a hospital in Florida, Advent Health, who basically wanted to integrate three different uh, electronic health record systems. And because they struggled or they had challenges in doing that, they basically went to one big health record system, that, which is uh, Epic. Uh, and that was a $650 million project. So, so the, the, the case in point or the takeaway there, of course, is that there was a use case where you could integrate the three different EHRs, build a canonical model and expose those as APIs and start your modernization journey from there. Right? Of course, the alternative is to go with a different system where everything is in a single system, but there are different ways of uh, approaching the same problem. Right? But that's a good case study. Uh, another stat I wanted to throw out there is based on HIMSS. Uh, this is from 2018, uh, I guess, which shows that the average hospital has around 16 disparate data sources, right? 16 different disparate electronic medical record vendors. And this is not even considering the other systems that you might have, like the finance systems, the uh, billing systems, the health record systems, so on and so forth, right? So you most probably are going to have more than one system. Again, very similar in two other industries as well. So what that means is you need a platform that can really connect to these multiple systems and pull information out of them. And that's the very first step in modernization, right? Okay, so then we've, we've looked at that. What's the second, uh, what's the third and fourth? Right? So modernization is important, right? Everyone in healthcare and digital healthcare and in any other industry, is looking at modernizing whilst having the back, back end systems, right? So there's two ways I would categorize modernization in healthcare. One is through connectivity, which means now you're gonna to connect to more systems, 
Like for example, you want to connect to your Fitbits, your Apple Watches, you want to connect to your diabetes sensors, your various other types of uh, wearables and sensors, right? So that's, that's one modernization via connectivity. A second modernization is via APIs, right? You, you are basically exposing APIs. You are, you are basically exposing uh, telemedicine services, virtual care services. And for all of that, you basically need some kind of API, right? So that's the, the two parts. Uh, and, and I'm just throwing this diagram out as well, which shows that just between 2017 and 2020, uh, the industry has progressed towards deep interoperability. And you can look at some of the bar charts there, right? Electronic access has grown to 67%. Uh, clinical views have grown to 38%. So integration is a big part of this. So I'm going to put a, a blueprint architecture diagram here. It's a detailed diagram. We're not going to go into details, but we, we are basically just going to look at some of the concepts, right? So we spoke about modernization via APIs, which means a northbound modernization, right? So you are, you're going to have more consumers like smart on fire applications, uh, different hospitals and insurance companies, uh, healthcare portals, kiosks, all kinds of applications consuming these APIs, which means the first step is to expose APIs, secure APIs, right? And these APIs can be in different formats, right? In the US, you have US Co, Karin, Da Vinci, like different canonical models uh, as part of the healthcare APIs. If you take the banking finance domain, that would have its own open banking standards. So different industries would have different standards, should be exposed as APIs. You then have the integration piece, right, which is supposed to transform information from whatever data format to a canonical model. And then you have the south or southern connectivity part where you're really connecting to different systems. And these can be, again, IoT devices, wearables, so on and so forth. Or it can basically be your, your Cerner's, your Epic's, your Athena Health, your different types of electronic medical record systems. Right? So all of that consists of the interoperability side, which is a critical part of uh, digital innovation in healthcare. Right? So we looked at the four points, getting data out of the EHRs, consolidating data, and then modernization via APIs, as well as connectivity. Standardization is a big piece in, in healthcare. Uh, Fire, HL7, X12, DICOM, multiple, multiple formats over the period of time. And then of course, regulation and compliance, right? You have the Center for Medicare, Medicaid services, you have the health and human services, you have the different government bodies or, or state-led bodies who, who push standardization. One of the nice things about healthcare is that the standardization effort was quite timely. In, I think back in 2015, the, the health IT roadmap was published. In 2017, 2018, like various standards started coming out. And then in, in 2021, July was one of the first set of standards, which was around patient access APIs, which said that every healthcare insurance company, which falls under a certain category, needs to expose patient APIs to third-party applications, right? And, and we worked with quite a few customers on those initiatives as well. And that's, that's a huge driver towards digital transformation because now the government itself is pushing, saying you need to expose data in a standardized format, in FHIR format, to all these third-party applications. Right? So the expectation in the US is that there's going to be an explosion of applications or healthcare applications. And there's going to be startups and, and, and multiple aggregators and different type of unique use cases around healthcare aggregation and healthcare uh, data consumption. Right? So there's a, there, there are multiple uh, use cases, multiple standards, multiple dates, uh, and all using some kind of standards to some extent as well, like the FHIR standard. So regulations are a big part of digital transformation, for better or for worse. Right, so we've looked at six steps as challenges. Uh, the seventh uh, and the eighth and ninth step are quite interesting because this is from the security side, right? So what happens when you start exposing APIs? What happens when you start innovating really fast? Right? What that now means is that you are taking data which was happily sitting in some backend system, right? It was sitting in an electronic health record system. In the banking industry, it was sitting in a co-banking system. 
And now you're moving some parts of those data to different parties, right? You're exposing an API, an aggregator can come and pull that data and store it somewhere else. Uh, a consumer can pull the data directly. Uh, an application can pull the data and then maybe decide to store that data uh, or, or just pass it on. But now you're moving data from some secure location to somewhere else, right? And that opens up a, a number of loopholes, especially on the security side. You then have the CIAM side in healthcare, right? How do you identify a patient? How do you identify uh, a physician? How do you provide permission to a physician uh, to your data, so on and so forth? And then consent management is a massive part of this. And, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Right? But we'll talk about the API security side. Just over the last two years, there was a number of uh, API security vulnerabilities, not just API security, but multiple healthcare security uh, vulnerabilities, right? Not just in healthcare, but other industries. But in healthcare, this is critically important, right? So there is a difference between your credit card being exposed, uh, where you can go and block your credit card, for example, versus your, your personal information being exposed in a healthcare attack. Right? There is a difference there. So uh, there was a recent white paper by Alisa Knight, which was named Playing with Fire, Hacking and Securing Fire APIs, which went into details about the various healthcare uh, implementations and the vulnerabilities on, on those implementations. And the fact that now, because data is moving from your backend systems to different places, that's where the attacks would happen, right? Because those systems might be less secure compared to data just sitting in one place. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't share information. That doesn't mean you shouldn't expose APIs, right? The whole API models, API security, OWASP, the top 10 principles, uh, the really good best practices that Newtonic spoke about uh, in terms of FIDO, et cetera. All of those are ways and means of controlling data, controlling who has access to data, making sure the right data is shared to the right people at the right time, which is also the uh, US government's uh, vision for healthcare. So there are ways and means of handling this, but you have to look at this as a total end-to-end -to -end supply chain problem. It's not just one part of the healthcare organization, it's, it's all the way up to the user, right? So we need to be conscious of the fact that these uh, information, these challenges exist. But that brings up another interesting question who owns healthcare data? Uh, in the past, and this is again, same in the telco industry banking as well, who owns the data, right? So in the healthcare world, there is of course this, this uh, misconception or, or maybe in some circles it's correct that the providers own the healthcare data or the payers own the healthcare data. Right? But as part of this vision, the patients themselves really own the healthcare data, right? They need access to their data. So if I'm a patient and everyone's a patient here, right? If I'm a patient, I need to be able to access my data. I need to be able to uh, decide who has access to my data. I should be able to uh, selectively say that this application has access to my data, so on and so forth, which is really the domain of consent management. So consent management today in the healthcare industry is different, right? Like you walk into uh, a healthcare clinic, there is a form that you fill, like a paper form or sometimes a digital form. There's like pages and pages of text that you read and then you sign at the bottom. But what you're really doing is giving consent of your data to someone, right? And that's it. But consent management is much more than that. Right? In the day and age of APIs, where data is being consumed real time by different parties, you should be able to give real time consent to the right applications as and when you need it, right? So, so which means when you are going into Apple Health, for instance, and if Apple Health is talking to uh, Health H HCA and Mount Sinai and Kaiser and multiple organizations, then at that point, you should be able to get into a screen and say, yes, I give access to Apple Health to consume this data from Kaiser, this data from HCA, and just my first name and last name from Mount Sinai. And, and I'm also going to give consent for a specific period of time. And maybe I can delegate consent to my uh, physician as well. Right? So that level of consent management is required if you really want to innovate in a sustainable manner. If not, it's going to be a half-hearted innovation where you are exposing information, but then someone else owns the data. 
right? For true innovation, you need control of the access on the patient's hand or the user's hand. Right? So let's go back to our diagram. We looked at the interoperability side. There is a security side to this problem, right? So you have the rate limiting, you have throttling, you have different API security concepts, you have the OWASP uh, security concepts that can kick in at an API gateway level, for instance, where you, you basically handle uh, security. Uh, Sanjeev spoke about cloud native applications and security being all his own, right? At any layer within the cloud native application, because you don't know exactly where these components are going to fit in or where they're going to be deployed, right? So that's another important part of it. Asanka spoke about the architecture, which showed like a, uh, the microservices model or cells. So you need to have security at each of those levels as well. But the other big part, as I mentioned, is consent management. Consent management is often an overlooked concept. Uh, and then even when consent management is put in place, it's at a very high level, right? So consent management today is mostly at an API level where you say, hey, Mr. Application, you have access to all my patient information. But in healthcare, that's not the case, right? In healthcare, you should be able to go a level below and say, application A, you have access to only my first name, last name, and, and date of birth for the next two months, because that's when I'm going to uh, visit you. Right? So you need to be able to go into that granular level and handle that. And that's one of the things we worked on from a WSO2 uh, identity perspective. And then, of course, you also need the observability side to be able to go in and see what's happening, who's accessing what, and be able to take uh, action based on feedback loop as well. So one part is interoperability in this blueprint diagram. The other part is the security and privacy side of things. So if you really think about it, any digital transformation initiative, especially in the healthcare space, is a intersection between interoperability and privacy. And digital healthcare innovation is really the intersection between both of these very important concepts. So we looked at nine points so far, and I'm just going to add a last point, which where, uh, where we mentioned that every healthcare company is a software company. Again, building on what Sanjeeva spoke about, building on what Robert spoke about as well. And Robert spoke about an important point where he, he spoke about the Wall Street, uh, the, this example that happened in New York, right? Where people were happy to share like personal information for a hamburger. But I think the, the explanation Robert gave there was that uh, customers or people rely on the organizations to protect their privacy, right? which is a very important point, which is a very interesting point as well from a security perspective. But at the end of the day, every company is a software company. And this is very much true in the healthcare space where organizations are looking to innovate fast by building a lot of systems internally. And, and organizations are moving away from like big canonic, a uh, big uh, monolith systems to much more modular microservices driven uh, systems that they could use to build uh, things. But as Sanjeev also mentioned, the shift is also happening from building business value versus building technology. Right? So you use the technology, but you, you build business value on top of that. And that's where WC2 comes in as well. So that's those are the 10 challenges. I, I mentioned, oh, I promised I'm going to go through 10 steps. Those are the 10 steps. As one last uh, slide. Uh, so, sorry, I, I wanted to also add the solutions for this, right? So point one and two is really about integration and interoperability. Uh, modernization is really about APIs, connectors, having a marketplace, exposing those APIs, having workflows to subscribe. When it comes to regulation and compliance, it's really about the time to market. You can have a package turnkey solution uh, to get go live very quickly, package services, et cetera. Your system needs to support these standards and, and need to keep up with the standards. When it comes to API security and CIM, you need like very strong identity systems. Uh, you need to handle patient identity across the board. You have aspects like multi-factor authentication, OWASP best practices, his uh, infrastructure level concepts like HIPAA and high trust, and then of course like things like multi-factor authentication, adaptive authentication, etc. Consent management is a critical part, a often overlooked part. Digital consent is a big part of this, and digital consent is not just getting uh, a bulk consent, but getting granular consent. And then of course 
for every company being oil, every healthcare company being a software company, you need a digital platform which can act as your blueprint for whatever innovation you're working on. So that brings me to my last slide, uh, just a slide on WSO2's healthcare solution, which is built on all the things that we spoke about today, uh, API management, integration, the IPaaS side of things, the cloud-based side of things, uh, the identity access management part. And we built specialized accelerators uh, for the healthcare industry, not just the US, but multiple parts of the world. And there's a, there are a number of customers are using who are using us for very critical healthcare uh, innovation. So if you need more information, uh, we have a specific site on the healthcare page. There's a sandbox that you can play around with as well. But at any given time, just contact any one of us and, and we can definitely talk more about this. Uh, that's basically it from me. 